Okay, part uh, three then. And over to Robert Gilpin, three ideologies um, of political economy. And, and this is a chapter from, from uh, a book called The Political Economy of International Relations, which is really a textbook, you know, you know introduction really, or overview of, of back in the 1980s, which has been quite widely used in, in different courses throughout the years in different um, universities. And this chapter reviews in an excellent way, I think, uh, the basic frameworks of thinking about the, how the economy can and should be um, organized. And ide he calls this ideologies, um, belief systems, paradigms, which has a descriptive side. So each of these strands or, or ideologies, as he calls them, they, each of them, um, have their own way of explaining causal relationships and describing how the uh, economy works domestically, internationally. He's focused on the international relations perspective, so it's mostly internationally. Uh, it, but if you call them ideology, it essentially means that it has some normative side to it. Each of these theories have a view of <clears throat> have an opinion on how the economy should be governed. So the word should uh, reflects a normative um, thing. You know, it's a belief system. It's a faith almost. And a lot of people criticize these ideologies or theories often for, for constituting a faith. I belong, or, or my thinking in international relations belong into the, you know, the paradigm or school of, of realism, political realism. That's formed you know, throughout the years, and, and I'm convinced that that's, um, in many cases, uh, at least in most cases, I think it's, it gives a good explanation of the phenomena we see in international politics. Others would say that this is a faith, you know, I'm... I'm and believing in something that, that, you know, it's not necessarily right and it's almost a religion and, and stuff. So you, you get criticized for belonging to a school of, of thought. And, and sometimes quite, quite rightly. Um, I don't particularly enjoy in academia this ideology thing. I mean, because it often contrasts with understanding, um, describing, explaining, and to tell people, it's not my job to tell people, you know, how you should think or how the world should be organized or value judgments. I, I don't do values. Um, so it's kind of a, a difficult often with, uh, and in particular with respect to these three uh, theories or ideologies or frameworks or schools of thought. But they are very useful in terms of understanding. Uh, they're idolized versions, really. There's three different ways of understanding, you know, the relationship between markets and, and the political sphere. And you see this, and you'll never get rid of these things. You know the phenomena they describe, and they're good explanations of many things that happen around the world. You know, liberalist thought will, you know, not disappear because it has some, you know, some 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 plausible explanations. A lot of plausible explanations of, of what happens in the economic sphere and in you know politics integrated with economics. And the same is true for nationalism. Economic nationalism or protectionism is another word. Mercantilism is, is a you know, word often used to describe the international economy in the 16th, 17th, 18th uh, centuries. But economic nationalism, you won't get rid of that thinking. So it gives an explanation 
possible explanation on a lot of things happening uh, in the international political economy. And then you have Marxist uh, thought as a third strand. <coughs> and the original um, version of that theory was kind of problematic in terms of prediction, because predictions turn out, well, predictions were false. They, they wouldn't, you know, they didn't get support by events um, a few decades later. But Marxist thought has been reinvented and reapplied. And in particular in the international sphere, because Marxist thought was, was focused on domestic issues, domestic economy at first, mid-19th century and, and the subsequent decades. Uh, but then, and perhaps in particular since Lenin wrote 100 years ago, and, and also with the scholars who operated and thinkers operating in, in after the Second World War, uh, the theory itself became internationalized and gave, and still gave, I think, uh, a, a plausible explanation of some of these forces in international economic sphere. Like the structural power of capital, for instance. Uh, what they can do and not do as a collective vis-a-vis um, -vis states. States have limited room for maneuver of them because they are dependent upon international capital, either finance capital or, or multinational businesses. So all three of these strands give very useful explanations on a lot of phenomena and mechanisms in international economics. The conflict among these three moral and intellectual positions has revolved around the role and significance of the market in the organization of society and economic affairs. The role and significance of the market, that's the key thing. Should the market govern itself? Should politics govern the market? And, and by how much? Uh, that's really the, the main point of contention. So I'll just walk through some of these um, Points, and I've touched upon many of these earlier, in particular with respect to the liberal perspective and the, the economic nationalist perspective. Liberalism may be defined as a doctrine and set of principles for organizing and managing a market economy in order to achieve maximum efficiency, economic growth and individual welfare. Emphasis on growth, prosperity and the individual consumer or producer. Not the state. The state is secondary. Not the collective. The collective is secondary. The individual, the producer and the consumer individuals are in focus. Set them free and let market forces, supply and demand, you know, create equilibrium. Let, let the market and, and market forces, supply and demand, uh, let let these things settle prices, because that would allocate resources efficiently. In contrast to command economies, for instance, where the state decides what to produce and not produce. Too complex and the result will be inefficient. That's a message. Uh, the economy should be market-based. Supply and demand should, as a general rule, set the prices. So in Norway, that's the case normally. That's the, the um, overriding way of, of organizing the Norwegian economy. Um, so if you have high demand for good, the price rises, more is produced, which, which, which can depress the price uh, somewhat in, in, in uh, the next instance. Uh, there's, if you, if you look at the, the um, wages in Norway, that's kind of an exception, just so you have the opposite, uh, um, opposite view. Because you have, you know, these labor unions and you have centralized uh, negotiations and you have, you know, a, a wage floor 
and, and you have rules and reg regulations. So, so wages are really regulated in, in my profession as well, which is for me personally a good thing because in a, in a, in a market-based wage system, I would you know, constantly have to negotiate my own salary. Which and I don't like these things, so so I let you know. I'm perfectly happy by you know having a centralized, non-market-based really, or only partially market-based um, settling of, of wages. But in general, Norwegian um, economy is is a market-based capitalist economy. Uh, Separation between economics and politics, analytically, these are different spheres. Uh, minimal state intervention, and, and there's a disagreement within that strand of theory, of course, how much the state should intervene. In some cases, what we call market failures, you have to, to have state intervention, because if you let the market totally free, uh, you get all these perverse results. One thing, for instance, is that you, you concentrate, you tend to concentrate ownership uh, and, and profits. Uh, you get bigger and bigger companies, and at the end of the day, you won't have any competition because you get a monopoly. Uh, it will happen. Uh, this is a really Marxist theory, but Marxist theory was based on the liberal perspective, actually, and 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 so the government has to intervene sometimes when you get these things. Government has to intervene to protect the environment. That's another thing because businesses, profit-seeking businesses, won't do that by themselves. And some public goods like armed forces and, and schools, etc., will normally have to be provided by the states. Police force, of course. So, so um, you always have state intervention, and, and even though analytically economists tend to look at economics as a different or separate sphere, uh, in the real world that's never ever the case. But the question is how much and when and, and how politics should intervene in economics. Some other uh, issues, markets arise spontaneously, naturally, and the free market by this invisible hand, you get these greedy investors, businesses, individuals, they think about, you know, their own benefits and, and but, but that gives them a drive and, and that spurs innovation, which, which in turn uh, leads to efficiency and economic growth and the possibilities of welfare, of building a welfare even a state even is, is conditioned on um, the extent to which the market can operate freely and the invisible hand can operate freely. These are, you know, thoughts from the 18th century, which has become, you know, the norm in, in uh, by far the majority of, of countries. Rational individuals are the basis of society. Society and the state are there to protect and to benefit the individuals, not vice versa. That's kind of a, a, an important separation between these um, schools, the first and the second in, in particular. So supply and demand, as I um, hinted to, they set prices. That calls for or leads to efficient resource allocation. The opposite was the case with the Soviet Union, to use a counter-example, where you had a command economy, a big, big, big country, and, and when the Soviet Union, during the Cold War, it grew to become more complex, the international economy became more complex, uh, technology became more complex, it proved difficult in the Soviet Union to sit in Moscow and tell different state-owned businesses what to produce, how much to produce. It, it gave these businesses perverse incentives, uh, which meant often you had a production target that specified the number of cars you should produce to get the pay raise or to get some benefits uh, as the manager of, of the firm in question. And then, of course, you 
try to spew out as many cars as you possibly can and you don't give a damn about the quality of the cars. Things like that makes it extremely difficult in complex economies to centralize decisions on uh, resource allocation. So the theory and often in practice as well, market forces you know, take that role automatically. That's at least the thinking behind it. And equilibrium and stability will follow and, and there's a long-term harmony, supply, demand, it's, it's, it's producers and consumers and consumers, if they, you know, tend to want a certain product, you know, they create a supply that, that uh, because there's profits to be made in satisfying consumer uh, wants. And the overall result, individual rationality and greed often, leads, in theory, to benefits for the society as a whole, social well-being. And they believe in, in gradual progress, growth, economic growth. Let the market govern. You will have ups and downs. <clears throat> you will have external forces, black swans, which can mess up things, economic crisis, financial crisis. Uh, but markets regenerate themselves and you find a new equilibrium, uh, new stability. And overall, the process, in theory, is progress. Um, so, and there are absolute gains to be won. Even though some countries, some states and some actors within states earn more than others, benefit more than others, there are gains to be made because the cake is expanding, so everybody gain. Everybody gains. Some gain more than others, but, but it doesn't matter uh, nearly as much as economic nationalists would say. So that's really the message for, from the liberal perspective. And then we have the nationalist perspective, which, which is really a forerunner to, to the liberalist um, way of thinking, because this was the for instance, the European economic thinking or dominating economic thinking for a long time before Adam Smith and others wrote about liberalist theory. But then liberalist theory became a reaction to, to nationalism in, in, in turn. And mercantilism, you know, the mix between and the interaction and mutual dependence between wealth and power, wealth and military power, wealth and state power. Um, so we call that mercantilism in these periods of, of frequent war and, and, and power balances forming and, and, and fighting over territory and, and fighting over control over international trade, uh, fighting over control over sea lines, which is really you know, the infrastructure of international trade. <laughs> so that was mercantilism, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. Um, statism is another thing. State capitalism, as I referred to earlier, is, is kind of the same, you know, uh, within the same uh, phenomenon, protectionism focus on state building and state interest and that's perhaps a key point or the key point here if you have to choose you choose state security <clears throat> state interest over economic activity so economic actors and individuals are subordinated to the state the state is the supreme actor and the state's interest should have preferences before or, or um, should be preferred before economic interests. So uh, that's the opposite of the liberalist uh, perspective. Primacy of the state, national security and military power. In the long run, that's necessary. The state has to prosper. If you have to break the uh, 
you know, let's call it liberalist, capitalist laws of, of um, even playing field, you do that if it benefits the state long term. And then you have some, you know, different, Gilpin discusses uh, different, two idealized versions, so to speak. You have the good or benign mercantilism the understandable and often accepted nationalism, um, promote national security, promote the national economy. You find that in China and now you find that in the US as well. And, and in certain sectors, you find that in European states, uh, there's other things than pure, you know, economic efficiency or market based transactions that should govern uh, this sphere. But then you have the, uh, and we know that from history, the malevolent mercantilism, imperialistic uh, mercantilism, the real, you know, mix between economic interest of the state and security and military interest. Um, European countries, for instance, have a long imperialist history where these kinds of interests were, were mixed together. And of course, the extreme example was the economic expansion and military expansion, territorial expansion of, of the Germans in, in the 30s and early 1940s. Wealth and power are, you know, really dependent upon each other. If you're powerful, you create more wealth for the state, everybody benefits. If you put power and military power, it requires wealth. Uh, it's dependent upon wealth. You can't be a powerful state without, you know, some economic base. That's that's obvious, and and, uh, and vice versa, really, um, according to to the national nationalist perspective. In particular, if you're a big country, major country, great power, smaller countries often have different. They have less room for maneuver. They're more dependent upon the functioning system of, of trade, etc. Great powers don't have that necessarily, the, the, this consumption. And a favorable balance of trade is vital for national security. And that's, you know, Donald Trump, his message vis a vis the trade balance with China. It's not always a consistent message, because, uh, but it is a basic message. But in terms of policy, Donald Trump's policies, it's, it's, it's um, on some areas, it's more fragmented, uh, I think. Um, the nationalist perspective has traditionally emphasized industrialization. Uh, poor countries, for instance, in um, or those who are not great powers, they have tended to want to shield themselves from international competition, from the liberalist perspective, from creating an uneven or an, sorry, an even playing field, because the thinking has been that first you have to protect your basic. Uh, industries. You have to protect industrialization. You have to create. Um, you have to create industries that are valuable uh, for the future. But if you go into this liberalist perspective, you have to specialize. If you're an agricultural producer, traditionally, theory, liberalist theory says that no, stick to that and join the international competition, sell your, your carrots and, and cucumbers internationally, and then you buy these this industrialized uh, goods elsewhere. And then critics and economic nationalists would say that you will always be poor, and you will never, you know, enter into a more advanced stage of the economy. Um, and there are so many positive spillover effects from, from being an industrialized country. Now we can say the same thing about high-tech uh, stuff. Because this is the future of the economy. Artificial intelligence, uh, mobile phones, high-tech, 5G networks, etc. 
Um, and then it, it's difficult, let's say, for the big powers. The U.S. is scared about China's rise and, and, and you know, China's technological rise. So they effectively say that, no, we have to limit competition, globalization on, in this area. We have to ourselves um, produce these things, be skilled, the most skilled country in these things, because this will determine power relationships, relative power in, in the future. So you protect your own sectors and you shut out the Chinese. And China thinks, I think pretty much the same. We have to be self-sufficient in high-tech stuff um, because we can't risk not being being that. If we go to a previous example, we often, if I say we, we in the West, we tell developing countries, poorer countries, no, you have to join globalization, specialize, sell your natural resources, agricultural stuff, and and. You'll be fine. That's the efficient way of doing that. Don't do tariff barriers on products. We do not want you to have tariff barriers. We have to sell your the products and we don't want to face high tariffs because then we're, we can't compete. Uh, so it's natural from the Western perspective because they would gain and their businesses would gain from such a thinking. But it's kind of condescending of course, because, because that means that a lot of these countries will never really industrialize, they will never really be, they can't compete now in high-tech stuff or in advanced sectors because they're capital poor and how to get over that, you know, that barrier, you can't really do that most of the time by entering into international competition because these things Developing the skills, capacity takes years, if not decades. And if you look at history, the paradoxical thing is that these big powers in Europe, in, in the US, and partly in, in parts of Asia, like Japan, they started out when they started to enter into real high growth periods, they did that behind tariff walls because they had this nationalist perspective that we don't care about you know, trading freely with everybody. We need to think about the state, security, um, the future um, growth of our country and future power of our country. So we have high tariffs in important sectors. So it's important, I think, to keep in mind that Germany and the US, paradoxically, in the latter half of the 19th century, they had high tariff walls. And they managed to build, you know, and in particular, perhaps the Germans, but also, of course, the Americans, they, they built these advanced, for the time, industries behind tariff walls. They did the opposite. The U.S. and Germany did exactly the opposite, you know, of their own recommendations to developing countries. It's kind of fascinating um, history, that. Self-sufficiency, we can't be dependent. It's dangerous to be dependent upon foreigners. I said the, you know, I told, I spoke about the high-tech example. Um, you know, you have various big countries, actually including the European Union, but also Russia, China, they have to develop their own um, G GPS, for instance, to take one other example, because it's easier, it's cheaper to rely on the Americans, you know, their satellites and their system. But the Americans, in any future conflict, they can, you know, switch a button and then you're off, you know, the GPS system. Or you're off the Internet. So the Chinese and the Russians, they have their own version because they can't risk it. Self-sufficiency. And I also referred earlier to, you know, Norway in the run-up to the EU election, you know, food. We have to grow our own food. We have to have high tar tariffs, keep the high tariffs, because in the worst case scenario, if we stop producing food, we're screwed in a conflict. And, and these are extreme examples, but they're quite natural, I think, this um, worst case scenario security focused thinking. 
And you'll find that in certain sectors, there's a difference between, you know, big powers and smaller powers, but in particular, bigger powers, they have to think deeply. And I quite understand, I think, why they have to, to think deeply about how much globalization they would want in critically important sectors, how much they can really depend upon the goodwill of their suppliers. Can we trust, can the Chinese trust the Americans in a long perspective? There's no way they should. Can the Americans trust the Chinese, you know, in a long-term perspective? No, they, they, they can't do that. The Americans, they shut down really um, the production a few years ago of what we call rare earths materials. It's, it's you know, these small things that are used in mobile phone, phones and computers, high-tech stuff. Critically important ingredient in, in uh, high-tech sectors. And you dig it up essentially from the ground. But it's costly and it's more efficient to do that in China. So during the, the height of globalization, the Americans, they, they um, no, they went to, or, or they let China dig it up and sell it to US companies, to Japanese companies, etc. And then you had a brief conflict, or a long-term conflict actually, but it was a brief um, heightening of, of a conflict, island conflict, I'll return to that in later lectures, between Japan and China back in 2012, I think it was. And then China shuts it stops selling these rare earth materials to both China and, and other countries. And you get, you know, a few weeks of panic in the sector. And that's really what, what this is about, this, this need for self-sufficiency. And then the Americans start thinking, no, we can't rely on rare earth from China in the years ahead. And certainly not in the decades ahead, the way the Chinese are growing being more assertive. We have to rely on ourselves, even though it's economically not really rational. So, and, and the Australians think the same because they have certain, certain um, such materials underground. So self-sufficiency and political autonomy, you decide, you, you manage insecurity and you re reduce national risks, risks to the, to the national economy and welfare. So, increased military power, national security, these, you know, things also flow from industrialization and, and in latter decades and years from a high-tech technology. If you want to be militarily effective, you need to be at a certain level technologically. China, you know, does everything it can to be as technologically proficient as possible. The U.S. is already at a really high level. The Russians think in the same way, they're quite competent. Europeans the same, but they don't normally think um, so much, you know, geostrategically. Otherwise, you'll end up like a, a Iraq under Saddam Hussein, whose military was strong, but it was not sophisticated because it was not high tech. And that's really, you know, you have to be at a certain level. You have to, uh, not in this case, industrialize in the old meaning of the term, but you have to go high tech. You have to have a capital intensive economy, a skilled economy, and that's really necessary, in particular for these big countries. If they win, if our enemy wins, we lose, also in the economic sphere, as I've um, spoken about earlier. And it's not a absolute gains and everything is fine and we can trust each other and we can trade freely. International relations is conflictual. In that respect, the nationalist perspective, it resembles political realism focus on conflict, on, on, on relative power, and, and uh, so it's, it's related, it's the economic version of political realism. Um, and interdependence is always asymmetrical. So, so when the liberalist paradigm says that uh, interdependence is good, for instance, 
increases the perceived risks of military conflict or diplomatic conflicts because if we're you know integrated economically it's too costly to, to go to war that was the basis of the European uh, community project back in the late 40s early 50s that thinking to be interdependent because that would raise the costs of conflict which would lower the likelihood of conflict. Um, and there's a lot of sense to that, to that story, to, to put it like that, but it has its limits. And, and according to national, the nationalist perspective, it's, it's one of the limits is that you know, interdependence is always asymmetrical because you have, um, these countries are not the same and regions are not the same, not the same size and not the same you know, skill level and one is always more dependent upon uh, another so <clears throat> so when china and norway was in the diplomatic spat starting in 2010 because the nobel peace committee in oslo gave the peace prize to a chinese activist uh, then china you know institutes a partial boycott of Norway, business, diplomatic, and, and etc. Which doesn't really matter to China because it's, Norway is small and far away. It matters more to Norway because the Chinese market and the number of people and the power of China is, is so much greater. So there's an asymmetry there which the Chinese utilize in their diplomatic and business dealings with other countries. That's no secret. It's not only about Norway. And, and um, so even though you can say good things about interdependence in terms of reducing the scope and, and likelihood of conflict, it's always asymmetric. So that was not the end, no. <clears throat> as far as they can, states try to create an international division of labor favorable to their political and economic interests. Indeed, economic nationalism is likely to be significant influence in international relations as long as the state system exists. Some people, and back, I think he wrote this in 1987, and a lot of people this was near the end of the Cold War, and a few years after, a lot of people would disagree. No, now we enter into a you know, phase of globalization, of economic efficiency, of trade, of absolute gains, positive sum game. Uh, but I think that was and still is an exaggeration. So I tend to, to totally agree with the last uh, quote here that, that it's likely to be a significant influence. It's always likely, I think, to have some the nationalist perspective, nationalist way of thinking in, in various countries. Always, it's always there. Gilpin talks about, um, for instance, about declining big powers like the U US, which has experienced for many years now increased competition, for instance, from Chinese companies. And these declining big powers, as the US is relative to China, they tend historically to be more sensitive towards these security issues. They tend to be more protectionist. And the US has been that before. I refer to the smooth holy tariffs. In, in 1930, and if you go to the 19th century, it's high tariff barriers and, and, and all that. So it's nothing new in American history. In fact, one can say that the period 1990 to 2010 or, or even later was kind of a special period. And, you know, in, you had this, this globalization phenomenon running wild and, and centered on America, uh, really. But nationalism, economic nationalism, is not going away. Okay, and then I'll take just briefly, I'll try to be brief now, the um, Marxist perspective, the third one. 
um, which has also had a huge impact in practical politics. So it's a theoretical perspective stemming from Marx and Engels in the, the mid-19th century, centered on domestic, the domestic uh, economy and domestic issues, class warfare, class conflict, capitalists, business owners against uh, labor or, or wage earners. Capitalism belongs, and, and they wrote this back in the mid-19th century, uh, based on economic liberalist thinking and based on you know existing trends in, in how countries govern their economy. And they criticized this. And on the one hand, on the other hand, capitalism was in Marxist, in the Marxist perspective, progressive because it would create wealth and integrate the world essentially until it would collapse by their by virtue of their internal contradictions. Capitalism was good for a period in the Marxist perspective, and then it would collapse. Um, and the original evolution and demise of capitalism was governed by three laws, as they put it. So, so briefly, you have the law of proportion, uh, disproportionality. Um, so they didn't, you know, the theorists didn't believe in, in the, that you know, if you supply a good, you know, the demand will appear and you will be able to sell your goods. No, capitalism, you know, each think, each capitalist thinking um, in terms of his or her um, own interest, they would tend to, to, to overproduce stuff. Uh, and then you would get, as you had in that period in the 19th century and, and, and um, until, you know, after the Second World War, you had these periodic depressions and fluctuations. You had the booms and busts, which, which uh, were quite dramatic and problematic and created a lot of suffering and companies going bust and workers out of jobs. And, and, and so the Marxists thought that this was integral to integrate it into the, you know, the system itself. And it couldn't go on forever. Second thing is the law of concentration or accumulation of capital, um, which they also drew from uh, economic liberalist thinking that capital tends to be concentrated. That's in their nature and you get bigger in a competitive economy domestically. Um, fewer people will get be richer and richer and concentrate uh, wealth. And that would prepare the ground for a social revolution, a revolution by workers, labor, against capital and the turnover of the state. State turned upside down and, and, and power to, <coughs> to labor. And then you have the law of the falling rate of profit. You know, you have capital abundance, you have, you know, um, Competition, serious competition, competition for life and death in the business sector. You have to compete, you have to rationalize, you have to uh, produce things more efficiently. You have rationalization, which means that you need fewer workers, which means that you have fewer consumers, which means that your business earns less, which means that your business goes bust. Uh, so it's a negative spiral. They, they, um, talk about. But capitalism, after Marx and Engels wrote, it did survive. It did survive Marx, it did survive for a long, uh, it still survives. There have been, you know, tweaks to the story. There's been social democracy, that's one thing. Increased state intervention. Um, and wages have gone up for you, you don't have mass unemployment, at least in, in, uh, overall. You, you know, workers have kept their jobs or, or gained new jobs, and wages have risen. You know, often in a sort of social democratic uh, kind of way. Um, 
so, so some of these things have 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 happened, and perhaps most importantly, the economy became internationalized in that period after Marx and Engels wrote. So you had other outlets for your products, other places to invest in. Uh, so the excess <coughs> capital and excess goods could be, you know, shuffled over to to other continents. Um, and and this open global capitalist system, it kind of, of destroyed some of the predictions or helped destroy some of the predictions of Marxism. And Vladimir Lenin, who became, uh, you know, the center figure for the Russian Revolution and then the beginning of the Soviet Union, this new empire um, that rose from the ashes of the Tsarist uh, Empire, Russian Empire. Uh, he spent some time during the Cold War writing about this short book, really about, um, which was written for, for many purposes, but it has become a classic. He tried to explain why you had the First World War, why this, and, and not least, why international labor couldn't, you know, organize and be opposed to these capitalist countries, big powers fighting each other. So he essentially started a new direction for Marxist theory, internationalizing it, putting it in an IR context or international relations uh, context. And he said that, okay, capitalism survived. So Marx was wrong in that respect, but capitalism survived because of imperialism, because in the last few decades of the 19th century, these European countries, they started for real, they've done that before as well, but for real started dividing up, you know, new territories, uh, selling their goods there, establishing their, their, their capitalist businesses there. And, and, you know, that's how you get away from these laws that were referred to a few minutes ago, these laws that damage capitalism. So colonial imperialism was, was vital, but, but at the same time, this would, you know, this would, would uh, lead to war. It would lead to the same outcome only later, you know, because these territories, uh, they have to be divided between and, and spread and, and, and given acquired by different great powers depending on their strength and the timing of the whole thing. So you would have losers here. Germany before the First World War was a loser because it came, not because it didn't develop, but it came late to the parties when all, you know, the earth was, was already divided into different spheres and, and, and the big powers, Great Britain, France had acquired their share, even Belgium had acquired a big chunk of, of, of um, or what we today know as the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And the Germans, they became Germany in 1870-71. As a previous collection of some 30 uh, different German states, you had one Germany <coughs> with high economic growth, but very little in terms of influence and control and colonies and, other states it would grow, like Germany, like the U.S., and other, and other states again would would not grow that fast, which would you know create conflict centered on colonial distribution, and these unequal relative growth rates would create tensions. And in the case of 1914, it would be the defining. Or, or the main reason behind World War I. There's a lot of uh, opposition to that conclusion, by the way, but Lenin is, is, uh, Lenin's book is, is, um, and theory is not to be discarded automatically. For those of you who, who would later like to, to write some term paper in other courses, um, Lenin's theory, contains a lot of, of things that may give, at first glance, a poor explanation of the causes of World War I, but uh, 
a deeper look might, you know, um, in my opinion, um, give at least some useful point to some of these useful forces. World War One was a European affair, many people say. Uh, but the other side of the story is that the colonial, the conflicts over colonies, not only involving uh, Germany, by the way, but involving Britain against France and France against, or, or Britain against Russia as well in, in partial Asia, that was a big part of the story of the conflict leading up to World War I. So, so in that respect, I think Lenin has some, some, some good points. But post-Lenin, you had some modifications of Marxism, and which is also worth uh, a look. And I agree with big chunks of the material or the arguments in some of these things. I mean, you, you have, and I disagree with, with other stuff, by the way, you have um, Imperialism without colonization, so now you don't have formal colonies. Some would refer to some of these structural things as neocolonism, uh, neocolonization. And that often has to do with the structural power of capital. You know, you can, the Americans in parts of, of uh, the Americas, their own, you know, bigger region, they, have, they haven't taken colonies. But these countries are so dependent upon U.S. money, U.S. capital, U.S. businesses that they have very limited scope for action in their foreign and often domestic policies. So, so it's, you know, some, this is one plausible argument in, in, in many cases. And it also may lead to perpetual underdevelopment. And that's also a bigger question and part of this um, development theory, Marxist-inspired theory. But, but um, some of these issues with, you know, the structural things, you know, the division between the rich North and the poor South, as one often uh, you know, simplifies the picture, or the structural power of capital. Investors, you know, they can punish individual countries. Because if they don't like collectively, they can punish individual countries collectively, although they do that often for individual profit-seeking reasons. They can, if they don't like the policies of Indonesia, for instance, like in the late 1990s, they don't have to say anything. They just have to withdraw their capital. It's difficult for multinational businesses who are, you know, tied up for decades often in, in that country. For short-term capital, you can, you can, if you invested in, in government bonds in Indonesia or, or stocks of shares of Indonesian companies, you can withdraw them, these, these investments, within a few minutes. If you don't like the policies of Indonesia, if they do some, you know, Institutes some economic policies that you don't like, you withdraw capital. And if 1,000 investors do the same thing, the Indonesian economy collapses. So collectively, capital has, or investors, international investors, have a lot of leverage or power uh, to use over the domestic policies of individual countries. As long as the system is structured that way, that you have free capital uh, movement, and, and um, so some of these, the point here, some of these uh, issues are found in this Marxist-inspired or linked literature, which has evolved over it's now over one and a half uh, century. But the basic message before I end is that these three perspectives, as a whole, gives. They give a very good you know, sense of how countries think, how people think, and, and what are the driving forces and, and complexities of, and dimensions of, of um, the international economy and the mix or interface between the international economy and politics. <coughs> so you might want to, you know, later in your studies, further explore this um, 
these things. So this I use this lecture I'll end in, in one minute. It's kind of of course different to the lecture the last lecture about security risk terrorism, but it's kind of linked to what is now coming, which is a look at the international system as a whole. Uh, so the politics, economics, the things about relative growth and, and, and positive sum games, negative sum games or zero sum games and relative gains and, and um, absolute gains. This will be furthered and, and we'll talk about that next time. Or the Western or US shaped system, and then after that, the international uh, relations more in more traditional sense, war and military conflict. So from now on, it's it's really an international relations perspective, which I will will uh, deal with in this lecture. So I'll see you later, or you will see me later. <laughs>